Hello everyone. Happy Guru Purnima 2020. So yeah, this weekend is the traditional Indian holiday of Guru Purnima when we honor all our teachers. And we also contemplate our blessedness to be able to receive teachings and practices that have substantially uplifted and enhanced our quality of life. So towards the end of this video, we'll do a little Guru Purnima meditation. And this will be a shorter office hours video because we have the webinar coming up later today as well, the Near Enemies webinar. And then probably after that, I'll do another video on um, a poem of Abhinava Gupta's in honor of Guru Purnima. And some of you guys are like, oh, you, you do too much and don't work too hard. Yeah, I probably sometimes work too hard, but also I really love and enjoy sharing this stuff with you. So most of the time it's quite nourishing. Okay, let's look at some of the questions that came in for this office hours. Divyam asks, when one has hurt someone due to which the other person went through hardships and the damage is irrevocable or seems irrevocable, what is the best way to do prayaschitta? And he uses a Sanskrit term there that means reparations or penance or um, some attempt to, to repair the damage or, or apparent damage that one has done. Um, not saying all damage is apparent, but sometimes we imagine it's much worse than it is. That is to say, sometimes we greatly underestimate others' abilities to recover from and even ultimately benefit from uh, challenging circumstances or painful experiences. And of course, acknowledging that people do have many people do have an extraordinary capacity to to recover from painful situations. Um, but acknowledging that, of course, should never be a, a, a kind of justification for just doing whatever one likes, regardless of the impact on others. Anyway, Divyam goes on to say um, that he's interested in prayaschitta reparations, not primarily to avoid the consequent karma of one's actions, but rather to support the other person in healing completely from the hurt and recover from the loss. Well, he actually says make to make the other person heal completely. And it's important to note that we actually don't have that power. We can't uh, reliably act in a way that guarantees healing for another person. But it is true that we can facilitate healing for another person and often in quite substantial ways. So if the other person is still alive and available and, and might be open to receiving a, a message or a letter or a communication from you, then the first thing to contemplate, I think, is what form of genuine apology would be the most healing. Now, apology is an interesting issue interpersonally because people often use superficial apologies to try to assuage their own damaged self-image and to try to win the other person's approval in a in a overly facile way and so we often rush to apologies that are premature because we haven't gone through the contemplation process that would really make that apology deeply meaningful and healing for the other person. So I always recommend not apologizing prematurely because then actually you damage your chances of successfully conveying a genuine apology later on because the person will be more likely to dismiss your attempt. Um, so it's better to say, wow, I, I can see I, I really hurt you or that you know my actions had a 
had a painful impact on you that I didn't intend, and I'm going to contemplate that and and come back to you uh, with what I've learned about this. And then the the apology that you come back with, in order for it to be meaningful, you must share a little bit about your process, the process of contemplation that you went through that le led you to this understanding that you now have of why your actions were um, harmful or facilitated harm for the other person and how you have come to an understanding of that a different mode of conduct would be more beneficial. So. So first, you know, in, in a meaningful apology, I would say first there needs to be empathy. You need to be able to say to that person, ah, yeah, I, I, I see that you're hurting and I see that my actions, um, you know, facilitated that experience for you. Now, if the person is not, you know, firmly on the spiritual path, you would use different language. And I say facilitated because, you know, we know on the spiritual path that we can't cause an experience for another person. We can't make them feel X, Y, or Z. Um, that is to say, it, the, the, the relationship between your actions and the other person's emotions or inner state is very complex actually. So when you do something that lands for the other person in a painful way, what's happening is a co-creation between your actions and their samskaras their past experiences that, uh, especially the unresolved ones that are hanging out in their system. And for people who are, of course, severely traumatized or even moderately traumatized, the samskaras usually play a bigger role in their experience of pain than anyone's actions. But they may not know that. They may say, you, you, did, you created this painful experience for you, you and you alone. And they're wrong, but there's no benefit in trying to teach them that they're wrong about that because that is circumventing the necessary empathy. Now, if you have a prior agreement with that person about, you know, um, supporting each other uh, with reminders of the truth, then that's different, you know, again, assuming they're on the spiritual path. But if not, the most important thing is to take full responsibility and to not deny that your actions, you know, impacted them in this in this very painful way, and you could use then the language of cause. I'm, I'm you know, I'm so sorry I, I caused this this pain for you, um, even though you know that actually the the causation process is much more complex, and that um, your actions can actually only facilitate pain or joy for others. And by facilitate, I mean that your actions can make a certain experience much more likely. So your actions can make it very likely the other person will experience pain, or very likely the other person will experience joy, but they cannot have a, have a sort of one-to-one -one causative effect. Um, but, like I say, knowing that cannot be a, 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 a pretext for spiritual bypassing and avoiding the, the really necessary empathy. Okay, so, so the empathy is, is first. Um, and, you know, I see that I really hurt you. I see that, and I understand that if I were in your position, I would be very upset too. Oftentimes saying something like that is, is received as, as genuine empathy, if indeed it's true. Don't say it just because you've heard that you should say it, <laughs> because the energy then of the communication is, is different, and the person doesn't, you know, suspects that, um, that disingenuousness uh, instinctively. So that's why it's important you go through the inner process by which this, this empathy actually becomes real. And so then if you, after offering empathy, if you share some insight as to the fact that you can see how and why your actions landed in that way, even if it wasn't intended. And you can mention, of course, that it wasn't intended, but people often stress that too much because they're trying to get a sort of rapid and premature forgiveness. And so they'll say, oh, I didn't mean to hurt you. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's probably pretty obvious if you're if you're anyone other than a narcissistic sociopath who who wouldn't be able to admit it anyway. But the point is, um, yeah, almost all pain that we facilitate for others, if you're at least partially conscious, is unintentional. And stressing that is a de is a defense mechanism, right? So uh, as I would recommend just slightly mentioning it and then and then really focusing on your understanding about how those actions were uh, painful or how they landed in a painful way for the other person and that you've learned something about the impact of your actions that you didn't uh, see as clearly before at least in relation to that person if not in general um, and then you know letting the heart crack open is also really important in apology that that you show the other person your genuine grief over having facilitated a very painful experience for them um, and that is also often really healing for the other person that they see that you're actually grieving this unintentional harm and so i would say uh, those are the key elements to a genuine apology you know the other person has to be um you know for this for this real apology i'm talking about the other person has to be convinced that you have actually gone through a process where you have come to understand why those actions landed the way they did and that you grieve that and you can grieve it by the way without self-blame or self-hatred right because this goes back to the topic of, of so-called free will we were discussing um, last weekend, that you can know within yourself, I don't advise saying this out loud, but within yourself you know I couldn't have done differently in that moment with the knowledge and experience I had at that moment. And so there's no reason to hate or blame or beat yourself up. And in fact, when you're beating yourself up, that is a self-referential mental process that takes energy away from this possibility of reconciliation and connection. So actually to beat yourself up is interestingly quite selfish because it occupies your, your, your life force energy in a self-referential process that isn't serving the connection. So that's important to, to realize that that uh, hating on yourself or beating yourself up is in fact a selfish act. So you can again truly grieve the impact of your actions without even a shred of self-hatred. Uh, I can vouch for, for that, that that's really really possible. Okay so I could say more about that, that topic. I think it's really important but um, we do have other questions as well. Um, let's see. Elizabeth asks about the process of digesting samskaras, uh, these unresolved past experiences that are, as it were, hanging out in our system, in our energy body. And really, um, as, I, as I've mentioned before, there's no traditional practice in which it's explicitly said this is the way to digest some skadas, but rather there's many practices that that have that as as one of their possible effects. But the thing about practices and their results is that we can't actually guarantee uh, any any particular results. So the so the tradition is usually hesitant to sort of promise those sorts of results aside from you know the tantras that are covering uh, magical rituals, they, they over-promise. Like, if you do this ritual, you will have this magical power. But when it comes to the, the, the liberation practices, you know, they'll say this practice can eventually lead to liberation, um, but they usually don't make promises about the sort of steps along that journey. Do this and you'll digest all your samskaras. Um, but it's understood that if you are in the spiritual process, doing the practices, that the opportunity to digest samskaras will repeatedly arise. And you may have found that when you're firmly on the spiritual path, life tends to give you this opportunity in abundance. 
and it's said in, in this tradition that when you resolve to awaken, the whole universe, as it were, <laughs> becomes your co-conspirator. Um, and, and this is, of course, metaphorical language. It's not the case that the, that the universe is some separate entity with a mind that's like, oh, now I'll send some lessons to this person. <laughs> you know, it's not like that. This is really just metaphorical language that, that, that is effective because it certainly seems as if, wow, this, like, <laughs> the universe is conspiring to support me in this process of awakening, including the digestion of samskaras by presenting situations which trigger those samskaras, because usually only when a samskara is, is triggered uh, can we really have the opportunity to digest it. Now, so this happens in everyday life, and so it's, it's very important to view these moments as a golden opportunity, meaning to say, if you feel triggered and you realize, oh, okay, my reaction here is disproportionate to what actually happened. If you have the clarity of view to see that, you've already made a lot of progress. But um, <laughs> so, so usually our reactions are disproportionate to what just happened in real time, but they're perfectly proportionate to what's still unresolved in our system. Meaning to say, one never actually overreacts. One is reacting proportionately to the samskaras in one's, in one's psyche and, and in one's energy body. Um, and those are really the, the same thing from, from the Eastern point of view. So then you realize, okay, the person who's in front of me now or earlier today or yesterday um, was the catalyst, was the trigger, right? They triggered this samskara. So, and their actions you know, are involved in the situation, but um, usually mostly what's happening is that the is the the unresolved past experience is now is now all triggered, and you are in this disproportionate amount of pain or anger or frustration, whatever. So then, please take that opportunity to digest, because if you just get in a fight with the person who's triggered you, you're not taking the opportunity, right? If you just numb yourself to the unpleasant emotion, you're not taking the opportunity. So taking the opportunity means taking a moment by yourself to be with the feeling, to, to strip off the story, like, oh, this person really hurt me, right? Even that is, 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 is a story, it's a narrative. Many of our stories are just, you know, this one sentence, but it prevents digestion. Because if you believe, oh, this person caused the experience, then you're not able to digest the samskata, which requires a kind of intimacy with a deeper truth. So you, you peel off the story, lay it aside, say, it's not about denying the story either, because then you're in an argument with the story. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, that's neither here nor there. Let me lay that aside, and let me focus on just the raw feeling itself. Let me bring it in close and affirm to myself, I can digest this. And the reason we use the metaphor of digestion in this tradition, as opposed to others like release, is because all unresolved experiences hold potential life energy. There's life energy locked up in those samskaras that when we digest them, there is um, enhancement to our total prana shakti or life force energy. It's, it's amplified. We, we feel more alive when we digest as opposed to just let go. And when you digest, just like digesting food, some portion of the energy does flush out uh, that's not needed and some portion of the energy uh, you know, merges with your energy body as pure energy and then brings this enhancement of your aliveness. And this is just a very brief overview. More on this is in chapter 11 of the Recognition Sutras. Now another way to digest samskaras that, that doesn't depend on, um, you know, life experiences that, that unexpectedly happen is to, in meditation, usually sort of towards the end of a meditation, but it could happen at any point, you invite um, this possibility by affirming, I'm willing to feel whatever needs to be felt. Now, if your meditation practice is primarily transcendentalist, then you're, this is unlikely to be effective because you, you kind of are 
subconsciously or consciously seeking to attain some kind of higher state, transcendental state in which you rise above and beyond your humanness, then it's unlikely you'll, you'll be able to access what needs to be digested. So in this tradition that's not recommended, you know, transcendental experiences can come of their own accord and that's great, but we don't seek to transcend our humanness. We seek to realize our humanness as an expression of our divinity. So we want to be, be in it, <laughs> right, but also not um, identified with it, right? So for every emotion and every, every experience that arises, in this tradition we practice neither ownership nor denial of ownership. And that's what distinguishes Tantra from, say, Vedanta or some other traditions, where they do deny ownership. This is not me and this is not mine, to try to transcend it. And we say no. Neither ownership nor denial of ownership just intimacy with what is and a willingness to be with what is, but also a willingness to, to let the energy do what it needs to do because it's not a static being with what is. It's a dynamic being with what is where you, again, are inviting the energy to move as it likes, inviting it also to digest. So if you're making a, a self out of the experience, meaning if you're self-referencing the experience and um, kind of, you know, making a self-image out of it, then it's not going to digest. So that's a kind of ownership. And if you deny ownership, push it away, then, and try to transcend it, then it also doesn't digest. Um, and then there's many, many practices that also facilitate samskara digestion, but um, I'll have to get into those another time. Uh, energy body practices primarily. And, and we do get into that somewhat in the, in the Foundations course on tantricainstitute.org. Okay, so... Just seeing if there's anything else there. I guess not for right now. Okay, we have a couple questions in the live feed. Uh, Susanna says, hi, by the way. <laughs> Hope things are good there in, in Spain, if that's where you are. Um, she asks about a, a list of main philosophical and practical similitudes and differences between Kashmir Shaivism and, and Sri Vidya. Um, well, first of all, this is this is not uh, really an uh, an authentic dichotomy, right? Kashmir Shaivism is not a traditional term, and usually by that term, people mean Trika lineage, um, roughly. So perhaps Susanna is asking about the differences and similarities between Trika lineage and Sri Vidya. Um, well, there's many, <laughs> many many similarities and differences as well. It's important to understand that um, traditionally these are these lineages or lineage groupings, these sampradayas, are under the same umbrella. Like we say non-dual Shaiva Tantra and that confuses people who make a distinction between Shaivism and, and Shaktism. But in the original classical tradition there was no such distinction, meaning Shaivism, you know, was a, was a catch-all term for all the um, goddess uh, traditions and the, the Shiva traditions which were thought to be um, interrelated and interdependent, you know, they're a part of one dharma, really. Um, so later in late Tantra this distinction arose where some people called themselves Shaktas, you know, goddess worshippers, not Shaivas, Shiva worshippers. But in the classical period, to be a Shaiva meant to be a, a follower of the tradition of, of the goddess and or Shiva. These were, again, not, dis, not distinct traditions. So if we want to kind of make that more explicit, instead of non-dual Shaiva Tantra, we could say non-dual Shakta Shaiva Tantra. 
but you know it becomes quite wordy. Uh, but anyway, Sri Vidya was is is very much part of this whole complex. It's not uh, some separate tradition, and we see that very clearly in a in a scripture like Yogini Hridaya, which has been translated into English. I don't know if it's the complete text, but but um, maybe it is. Andre Padu uh, translated it into French, then it was translated into English. Um, it's not the most readable book, but it is at, at least, you know, fairly accurate and it, it, it exists. And in the Yogini Hridaya, the, the heart of the Yogini, we see this um, kind of almost synthesis of, of Trika and Sri Vidya teachings. It's, it is a Sri Vidya text for sure, but influenced by Trika teachings, influenced indeed by the recognition sutras, the Pratyabhinya Hridaya. Um, uh, so that's that's all I can say about that right now. Um, Tim says, "Is Boga work? Is Boga um, learning how to be?" happier, learning how to enjoy life more, learning how to be more successful at the sort of game of life. Is that worth focusing on at all prior to full recognition of self as awareness? Or does bhoga come simultaneously as you stabilize your awakening? Um, it depends on the person, you know. For, I mean, for some people, the answer to the first question is yes, that, that um, if, if self-recognition, if self-realization doesn't, is not accessible as a realistic goal of spiritual practice, then it's, it's more infor, uh, important to focus on sort of just getting, getting yourself together, getting your life together, um, you know, developing a healthier ego, a more functional ego, which doesn't necessarily mean a more robust ego, right? In fact, a healthier ego is 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 strong but malleable, like um, you know, like like the reed. <laughs> it said the reed that bends in the wind but does not break um, is one metaphor for for a healthier ego. And and for many people, they need to focus on that before they can. Um, start to sense self-realization as a more realistic goal. And if they start to feel the benefits of, of spiritual teachings that are life enhancing, then they might start to get curious about um, this deeper goal. And indeed the tradition says, you know, when people see that the, that the practices uh, make them happier, you know, and bring about some of their worldly goals or, or support in, in, in that, then they might start to believe that self-realization is actually possible. You know, whatever term you want to use for it, awakening. Um, and then Tim says, does bhoga come up simultaneously as you stabilize your awakening? For some people, it does. So awakening can have as a byproduct more happiness and, and sort of sort of success that the other people can recognize as success but not necessarily it depends on the on the person you know so we can't really guarantee that now if you're actually awakening to your true nature it's it's going to be increasingly irrelevant to you if that has the side effect of um you know more success in life but it does tend to happen that if you become more awake and then you're able to integrate that awakening into your, your psychology and your embodiment that, um, you know, it tends to, to give rise to um, qualities of behavior and understanding that uh, are, are for most people going to be highly beneficial in every arena of life in relationships and career and so on. Yeah. So again, just brief answers here um, in this particular satsang. And in the live feed, some, someone else yeah, refers to this, this 
issue of uh, some scadas, and I also want to just issue a caveat there, <laughs> offer a caveat, which is, you know, some people have the idea I should get into or remain in painful and challenging situations in order to surface my samskadas so they can be digested, integrated, healed, and, and so on. Um, that's a dangerous attitude because if you are not yet ready, not yet capable, not yet strong enough to, to digest some intense experiences, then it's also possible that you um, actually deepen those samskaras rather than resolve them. It's possible you re-traumatize yourself. It's possible that you end up with more to heal than you had before. So, you know, life in general is very good at offering us opportunities to, to see our samskaras and, and resolve them. And a, a kind of idea that you, you need to stay in painful situations uh, is I mean, sometimes it's true. That's why I can't <laughs> issue a general prohibition here. But um, generally, if if you know, you realize it, it's very important to contemplate. Do I really have the bandwidth? Do I have the the capacity, the resources right now to truly digest what's what's being triggered in in this relationship? If if not, I need to step back, and that's super important to acknowledge and it takes humility and a lot of people don't have that humility they don't realize when they're when they're about to be past their their limit or exceed their bandwidth and again that's very important because you don't want to you know put yourself in a situation where there, there's then more <laughs> even more um, healing that, that needs to be done and let's of course remember that healing is not uh, per se necessary on the spiritual path. Well, some healing is necessary, but but it's not the case you need to heal all your samskaras in order to abide in awakeness. But it is the case for many people that they need to resolve uh, and digest some degree of their of their samskaras, otherwise um, they're not able to, to abide in their true nature. The, the gravitational pull, as it were, of the samskaras keeps, keeps pulling you out of your um, essence nature. Not that you can actually be pulled out of it, but you seemingly can, <laughs> and uh, it, it definitely can feel like that. So, Um, we have some technical philosophical questions as well that I don't know if we if we have if I have time for but um, we'll see what else we we get to Daniela asks about Italian translations of tantric texts that are worth buying Um, there's lots of good Italian translations, but they're not necessarily accessible. Um, Gnoli, Gno, however you pronounce his name properly in Italian, Gnoli, um, it was certainly a, a great scholar. I don't know if he's, he's still alive. He might be. He's, he'd be very old. But um, he was a great scholar, not necessarily an accessible writer, um, and, but his translations are for the most part uh, reliable. Torella, another great, great Italian scholar, not a practitioner, not very accessible, but a great scholar. Um, Jana asks, she says, I'm new to these teachings and have a basic question. Is a living teacher or guru needed in the tantric path to fully realize the truth of oneself in the universe? Yes, for most people, yes. Uh, we've covered this topic quite a bit, so maybe group members can can point you to those resources. Um, and there's some discussions in, in Unit 1 in the Facebook group on this as well. And she says, do you, do you yourself have a guru? Yes, I have several gurus. And to, to me, I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine 
how any of this would happen without without my gurus. I mean, if I had just like found these books and texts and never had these these wonderful teachers, no, it would just be it would just be a intellectual hobby. However spiritual I thought myself, <laughs> it would still have been just an intellectual hobby. Um, and and to me, it's there's no. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't even imagine how people believe that one could walk this path without living teachers. Um, to me, that's a delusional belief, but, you know, that's from my perspective. Um, okay, let's, let's just go back to the original thread here. Um, Anami asks about hi Anami asks about um, a mantra for the full moon. Well, one great mantra is that verse, that Sanskrit verse, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate. And there's a video on that verse in the group. Um, that's a really really beautiful verse to do for the. For the full moon. Um, okay, let's see. And and to contemplate its meaning as well. I, again, I've already gone over that in that video extensively, so um, I'll, I'll refer you there. It's in the mantras unit in the Facebook group. Um, Mandania, I'm not sure if I'm saying the name right, Mandania, Mandania says, uh, talks about an inadvertent or unexpected kundalini awakening a few months ago in Tiruvannamalai, amazing place, uh, and he says, he or she, or they, I didn't ground the energy, as you describe in your Kundalini video, and I've experienced many negative side effects. Things have settled and the spiritual urge is, is now returning. I'm concerned I'll do more damage than good if I return to practice. Any advice on how to proceed in the healthiest way possible? Well, it's hard to give general advice about this, but there is some. <laughs> the most important thing is that you have access to teachers you trust and, and a community that provides a container. You can't underestimate the value of container when it comes to, to Kundalini, because Kundalini um, without container can easily sort of go out of control for some people. So um, a, a community at which you feel at home with access to teacher or teachers that you trust, that is the mo that's the most important thing for for um, Kundalini to to proceed with her unfolding in a kind of sustainable and measured way. Um, now, traditionally, you do sort of pray <laughs> to the Kundalini and say, "Please take it easy. Please be gentle with me." You know, this is my first time, and. Um, you also sing a hymn like Kundalini Stavaha, which is a beautiful hymn that uh, is is a, traditionally a way of again um, uh, entreating and and inviting the Kundalini energy to to uh, proceed gently rather than um, sort of too too quickly. I mean, there's not really a such th such a thing as too quickly unless it's so quick and intense that it results in a, in a psychotic break. But even then, usually, the psychotic break is very much a temporary experience and um, and doesn't result in, in long-term, you know, mental derangement. But ideally, one wants to avoid that possibility, even though it's an outlier possibility for, for most people. Um, yeah. Okay, so, oh, and also in response to Mandanya, the foundations course, uh, the free foundations course on tantricainstitute.org, um, 
is a is a good course to help you with grounding and kind of stabilizing the energy and there's not any practices given there that'll overstimulate um, awakened kundalini and there's other teachers also here in the in the Facebook group that have tremendous experience in this I'll mention too um, Kurt Koitzer who's, who's um, really steeped in, in Tibetan Buddhist traditions, but also Shaiva and Shakta Shaiva traditions. He's an expert in, in Kundalini, where it's great to have him in the group. He actually put up the very first Kundalini FAQ ever on the internet. Um, so yeah, he's a, he's a bit of a legend. <laughs> and then we have um, Kolb Jorn Martins, who's also quite expert in, um, in, in Kundalini, and you know he's he's a teacher that uh, is is fairly demanding of his of his students, which some people like and others don't <laughs> so much. But he certainly is um, very very knowledgeable in in terms of all kinds of Kundalini phenomena. Um, and it's good to have multiple teachers because teachers in general will talk about their particular view or, or doctrine and experience as if it is um, the way things are and in fact there's there's more diversity in, in, in both doctrine and experience than, than usually any single teacher will acknowledge so that's why I, 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 you know learning from multiple sources can be good so that you don't get this idea that whatever the, the one teacher says is just how things always are because it's not um, in general not the case oh gosh there's some good questions here but um, <laughs> time is, is short uh, let's see okay Aubrey Aubrey says, um, talks about sudden versus gradual enlightenment. And she says, the direct path to realization is, seems to be lacking something. It's lacking kind of integrative or holistic understanding. And it can be rather dissociative. That's true for some. And the gradual path, by contrast, is seemingly endless. There's always something more to address, more criteria to be met. Whereas the middle path between sudden and uh, versus gradual enlightenment, um, Abhinava Gupta teaches exactly this, and and very few teachers in the tradition do. They they, they they mostly really land quite strongly on one side or the other. You know, these like Advaita Vedanta teachers who are like all about sudden enlightenment, and there's no there is no real gradualism. There is no r real um, practice that can that can possibly, you know, gradually um, e evoke realization and, and liberation. Um, whereas others are very strongly in favor of that and say there's no sudden enlightenment. But Abhinavagupta teaches, and this is a huge topic, but um, he teaches that it's actually both that you what you want to do is create conditions where sudden realization of some aspect of reality is possible or even sudden realization of the whole of reality but that's quite rare create conditions in which sudden realization uh, is very much possible and then do the gradual practice while continually opening to the possibility of these sudden um, leaps of insight as it were or realizations of some fundamental aspect of, 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 of your nature of essence nature um, so, I'll have to talk about this more another time, but it's, in his teaching, it's very much both and, and this is the whole point of the first five chapters of Tantra Loka, which are simplified and summarized in the first five chapters of Tantra Sara, which um, I translate on my blog. Okay, so Maureen and maybe this is the last uh, question we can do, but Maureen says, yogis have always talked to their teachers even after they have passed away or left the body as if they could somehow intervene in their life. 
how does this work? Are we just evoking the memory of that teacher or guru, or are they somehow available to us on some other plane? Um, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little complex. Now, awakened beings who leave their body, of course, don't, don't exist how to explain this? It's sort of like, <laughs> let's use a simple um, pop culture reference in in the Star Wars movies, right? Obi Wan Kenobi, who's sort of pictured as a as a as a Siddha. They don't use that term, but <laughs> Jedi Master is sort of like a Siddha, a self realized integrated being, and so he's he's killed and his physical body is killed, but then he becomes more powerful. He's able to visit Luke Skywalker in his light body form and dispense teachings. Now, this is kind of a lovely um, story, but it's not the case that a, that a, a, a truly self-realized being then continues to exist as a kind of um, distinct entity or soul uh, that, that could visit you in that way. And yet, <laughs> and yet, when you open to and invoke the power of, of grace, when you open to and invoke the influx of, of divine insight and energy and power, then it, the shakti, like the, 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 the fundamental energy of existence, can and, and sometimes does uh, appear to you in the form of your, your teacher who's left their body, you know, in a dream or in a vision or, or in some kind of felt sense. Um, So the simplest way to understand this is that the, that the universal shakti, the universal fundamental energy of, of the universe, um, can take on any form in order to kind of transmit <laughs> the, the insight. But this is not different from your own essence nature. You could say it's, it's actually your fundamental being, your, your divine self, though that's not quite the right word. Um, taking on the form of the object of your devotion, you know, so if you're especially devoted to that teacher who's left their body, then the Shakti will certainly, at some point, probably take on that, 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 that form. It forms itself into the, the object of your devotion, because that's the form in which you'll be most open to the transmission of, of the insight. Um, so. Another deep topic that really um, deserves more time, and, and hopefully we can get to that. I mean, you know, questions that come up over and over again, we we certainly do get to um, explore them in more and more depth. So please don't imagine I'm just deferring to a to a <laughs> um, endless uh, future that never comes. Uh, Lena asks about, can you choose your own guru? Of course, of course. You're, you are, you, you know, you're the empowered one in the, in the true and correct form of the teacher-student relationship. Um, you're, the, you're the empowered one. You get to choose who is your teacher. I mean, guru just means uh, trusted teacher, really, or, you know, a qualified <laughs> teacher and also sometimes a revered teacher. But anyway, yes, you can choose, and you can choose when to, when to end that relationship too, you know? And you, do, you can choose someone as your teacher without telling them that you have done, you, you can tell them it also, but it's not like the Vedic situation where you have to have this whole thing where you like, oh, here's, I present my dakshina, here's your gift, oh teacher, please accept me. It, you know, in the, in the tantric mode, um, you can, I mean, you know, some some would dispute this, but I think it, it's quite accurate to say you can choose someone as your teacher. You don't; they don't have to like confirm that. They don't have to say, "I am your teacher," or whatever. Um, though it 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 can depend. Okay, so let's finish up this video with that little. Um, Guru Purnima meditation.
that I mentioned. So some of you have done the Foundations course and you're familiar with the teaching of the Blessing Mandala. So if you know what the Blessing Mandala is, you can evoke that now. And if you don't, it's just a simplified version is to imagine and vividly evoke, if possible, all your teachers that are, and imagine them before you, you know, elevated a little bit to indicate your reverence for them, um, but not too elevated, <laughs> just a bit. And you imagine them in their light body forms, meaning radiating light, radiating loving wisdom. Now, this is not about the personalities of your teachers. Yes, they're flawed. Yes, they have human foibles and failings, of course. But right now, you're orienting to the grace that flows through them, not from them. So there's no need for infallibility or, or <laughs> you know, um, anything like that in your teachers, right? Because they are just conduits for this grace and, and this power of awakening. They're touchstones and conduits. So always remember grace flows through your teachers, not from them. So having said that, you imagine them in, in their light body form, so like having bodies of radiant light, because you are orienting to the grace and, and shakti that flows through your teachers, and it does. So, all your beloved teachers, imagine them arrayed before you. If you have a root guru, you put them in the center. If not, don't, don't worry about it. Don't think, oh, do I, should I have one? No, just don't worry about that. Just let all your teachers be there before you, smiling, full of love, full of um, the desire the beneficial, pure desire for you to realize your own essence nature. So your beloved teachers sitting in meditation posture, in light body form, smiling at you. And you can have a sense, even if you don't know what they look like, that all their teachers are behind them in their light body forms. And all their teachers are behind them in their light body forms. And in fact, it goes uh, as far as the inner eye can see, generation after generation, wave upon wave of lineage transmission, of, of grace, of, of power, of awakening. And then you remember and feel, if you can, that that power is flowing towards you. That in fact, there's this energy of awakening flowing like a river through all these teachers, right? And, and, and going all the way back to, to the infinite, really. And this energy is flowing to, through all these lineages straight to you. And they don't even have to be formal lineages, but all your teachers had teachers, and they had teachers. So that's what I mean by lineage. It's all flowing towards you, and it's all pouring into you. So imagine these radiant ribbons of light or even streams or waves of light moving through all these great beings and converging on you. And this energy of awakening, of blessing, of compassion, of presence is pouring in the crown of your head like wave upon wave of light or like streamers of crystal clear white light or even honey colored light, streamers of liquid light pouring in the crown of your head and filling your entire body. And remember how blessed you are to have received these teachings and practices and then contemplate that you're even more blessed than you realize because these teachings and practices have so much as yet untapped power 
you're already blessed beyond measure, whether you can feel that or not. So jaw relaxed, face relaxed, body soft and open, receiving that blessing energy pouring in the crown of your head. And continue to visualize or feel this as vividly as you can while you hear the following mantras. Om Gurur Brahma Gurur Vishnu Gurur Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Param Brahma Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Om Aing Guru Bhyo Namaha Om Paramashiva Rupaya Shri Guru Namaha Sadguru Nath Maharaj Ki Jai Guru Om, Guru Om, Guru Om. Deep reverence to that Guru Tattva, that fundamental principle within consciousness, whereby it seeks to wake up to itself in every possible form. Salutations to that Guru Tattva that manifests as all our teachers and as all that teaches us. May we continue to be open to the countless transmissions of insight and revelation of our true nature that come from within and from out. May we recognize the Guru Tattva in ourselves, in all our teachers, and in all that teaches us. Om. Now let that whole visualization of all those teachers dissolve into pure white light and invite all that light to fall like a waterfall into the crown of your head with the feeling that all your teachers and their teachers and their teachers are all within you. Indeed, all beings are within you and vice versa. Om. Nice to be with you all, and happy, happy Guru Purnima. About, it's about 10 hours till the maximum point of full moon. It's already full now. It'll be full tomorrow too, but the maximum point of fullness is in about 10 hours from the time of this live video. And I hope to see many of you on the Near Enemies webinar in half an hour, which is about Finding your soul's purpose. Om. Oh.